Christmas tree. It wouldn't be much of a Christmas without a tree, right? Glad we actually found a good one this year. Now with everything going on, I hope we can put some gifts under it. <sighs> Work is so unstable, and honestly, we're barely paying our bills right now. If I have to shut down the business again, we may not make it. A lot to be joyful about, right? <laughs> you know what's funny, though? This overpriced tree does have a good purpose. Beyond the lights and tinsel, hanging these ornaments is their favorite part. It's so special for them. Almost all of these are priceless to us. They're memories, physical reminders of where we've been and what we've been through. Some from our childhood, others that the kids made when they were little. Antiques and heirlooms passed down through our family for generations. They are small, and they only come out once a year, but every time I hang them, they somehow manage to surprise us and remind us of something more important. <laughs> oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree. So this Sunday is the Sunday of joy, and uh, I, I pray that as we have been going through this Advent season, that our heart and our mind is set forward of looking uh, to the Lord who does bring hope that the world cannot, peace that the world cannot give, and joy uh, that the world cannot bestow upon us. So we will be looking at the lot of joy this morning. If you would stand for the honor of reading God's word. We are going to continue in 2 Corinthians, but I'm going to read a passage in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 21. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he, till he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Let's pray. Lord, this morning I pray that you would uh, speak to our hearts, God. We are our Thankful for your love and your mercy and your grace, God, and the, and the fact that, that you have conquered death. And so, Lord, our, our prayer uh, goes out to all throughout our, our, the nation, Lord, in our state, on the western side, our, our brothers and sisters who are experiencing loss right now. And we pray for them and lift them up and ask that you would... Uh, that you would comfort them, God. So, Lord, speak to us today. Lord, may we realize uh, the glorious truth of your gospel and how it impacts our lives. Lord, help me to preach plain and clear today, so plain that a child could understand. I, I do understand that of all the people in the room, that there is a heavy judgment on my life in rightly dividing your word of truth, and I do accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray, in his name that I preach. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, we do want to be praying for all of our Kentucky families uh, in, in Mayfield as it, as it struck there and then went through Benton and Princeton and Beaver Dam before it started weakening in Breckenridge County. It was a, a tornado that stretched for more than 220 miles. And I know if, if, if you're like me, you woke up that Saturday just shocked at uh, the devastation of what happened. And uh, when, you, when you see a tragedy like that, when you see a devastation, it kind of reminds us of the temporary reality of life. Haven't we been talking about that over the last few weeks? That in one second, your life can change. It, buildings that may have taken years to build in a matter of seconds destroyed. 
and uh, it lets us know that, uh, that, that this life uh, is fragile. And, uh, and so we need to be praying for those who lost loved ones, who, um, you know, moms and dads and, and husbands and wives and, and children um, taken from families. And so uh, we want to bless, we want to try to be a blessing to them. Um, one way we can help uh, our Kentucky ba- that Baptist Disaster Relief is already working to get help there and aid there. And uh, we're working on ways to get uh, ways to help. One, but, but one main way to help is that we don't even have to be there, but if we wanted to give, if you wanted to give financially uh, to help get the resources that need there, we can do that uh, through the disaster relief program that we have. So on our website and on our app, there is a way for you to give uh, to give electronically. And then if you want to write a check today, you can put in the memo uh, disaster relief, and we'll make sure that, that that money goes to helping those families there in western Kentucky, okay? So uh, we do want to be mindful uh, of that. And, and in light of the, what happened with our text this morning, uh, I, I feel like we can gain some, some hope and peace and, and even a little bit of joy. And I know that sounds odd, you know, to have joy in the mix of suffering. You know, how, how, can, how can that happen? And, and uh, how do we experience joy when we know uh, so many are going through pain? And, and this morning, I believe that the text of Scripture uh, gives us this, this hope uh, that gives us a sense of peace. And that brings a joy to us because we realize uh, that, that there is something that God has promised that is so great. Uh, that cannot be taken away. That death will be swallowed up. Death doesn't have the final say. How many of y'all are glad to know that death doesn't have the final say? Because every one of us here, we have lost someone that we love. Okay? We've lost somebody and we have felt, we have felt the separation. We have felt the pain of that. And, but I, I'm, I'm here to tell you that we can have, have joy in the midst of the reality that death is here. Because I, I want to talk about three truths today. And here they are. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the three then we're going to break it down. And here's the first one. Death doesn't destroy my person because the spirit guarantees it. And death doesn't change my purpose because my faith directs it. And death doesn't hinder my reward because Christ gives it. How many of you all think we can have some joy today in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2? He says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I I want you to underline that word eternal. See that word eternal. We'll come back to that. For in this tent we groan, longing to be put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Truth one, I want you to, to, you can write this down, put it on a, on a side note. Death doesn't destroy my person because the Spirit guarantees it so I can have joy. Now, he compares our body as a tent. Uh, now, a tent is something that you would not want to live in uh, for temporary circumstances. It's, it's, a, it's something to, uh, to go camping in. You might spend uh, a few days in a tent, uh, but there's a problem with tents. They, they, tend, they tend to rip, and they can tear, and they can wear thin. And, and, and Paul is saying that this, this body that we have, it, it, it's a tent. And, and like we looked a little bit last week, the, the older you get, the, the more you realize how that tent starts to break down. Amen. It wears down, it, it rips a little bit, there's some tears in there, and it starts fading in, 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 in places. And so, so he says that, that this, this body that we have here is like a tent. And when we die, it's as if we break down our tent, this, this, this body is broken down, it, it's, it's taken down, 
And then we are clothed with an eternal dwelling of God. Now, now in this in this text here, um, some scholars see that this is that Paul is is referring to a hope that even he had that he would be alive when Christ returned. That 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 he would see the coming of the Lord, and then if he would see the coming of the Lord, because those who are alive, who uh, when Jesus returns, those who are alive, the Bible says that the, that the dead in Christ will rise, but those who are alive will be caught up together with him. So in, in that instance, it's as if you have your tent, and then you just, you're get getting thrown over to you, a greater house, a, a greater clothing, if, if you will, an eternal dwelling. But now we've all been to funerals and we know that, uh, that when we lose someone we love, their body is still present. Now, the Bible is clear that to be absent from the body, meaning death, for a believer, is to be present with the Lord. So we know that when a person dies, their spirit goes on to be with the Lord in heaven. But we also know that there is coming a day, and and that's what the Advent is about. The Advent season is not just about looking at the first Advent of Jesus coming in Bethlehem as a baby. That is one aspect of it, that Jesus came. He he came as God in flesh, and he, he put on an earthly tent. And he walked among us. Then Jesus died on the cross and he rose again being the first fruits. His resurrection, was it a spiritual resurrection or a bodily physical resurrection? Talk to me, church. Bodily physical. When Jesus ministered back to his disciples after he rose again, He wasn't just in a spirit body. He was in a body. How do we know that? Because they touched him and he ate. He had a body. He is the first fruits. Now, Paul said, the reason why we can be assured that even though we die, our spirit goes to heaven, that there's one day as we're looking for the return of Christ, when Jesus returns, that There will be a resurrection of God's people and we will receive a glorified body just like Jesus had. Now, we won't be Jesus, but we will be made like Jesus in that we will have a glorified body. And now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good. What about you? A body that doesn't wear out. There's no disease, no sickness. Uh, You don't have to worry about your muscles aching, your joints aching. Uh, It's going to be a wonderful, joyful place. Amen? Uh, That's the reason to, to have some joy. Now, I don't know what this bond, you know, how's it going to work? I don't know. Do we get to pick, you know, do we get to say, I'd like to be 6'4 and 230? You, you start thinking about heaven, you know, start thinking about the, the kingdom of God when, when he makes all things new. And man, I mean, you just, you're, you're, you just start thinking. About, how many of y'all have ever just think about that? Just think about how, man, how amazing it's going to be. How beautiful it will be. That there will be no death. There will be uh, no sin, no suffering. Um, There'll be uh, no hatred. We'll we'll be with with the Lord. uh, We'll all be, those who, who are in Christ will be together. It'll be one It'll be one family reunion where we all get along. Won't that be a miracle? And we, 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 won't, we won't talk about one another. I mean, request prayer for one another. We will, we will be in a, in a perfect paradise. Now, Paul said this. He said, I has not seen nor ear has heard. Neither has it entered into the thoughts of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Can you you imagine? You see, uh, death 
Death has no power over my person. It doesn't destroy my person because the Spirit guarantees that I'm going to be resurrected because the Spirit was given to me as a guarantee or a down payment. The Holy Spirit, when you're saved, when you call upon the name of the Lord for, and ask him for, for mercy and grace and he saves you, you are sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit and he is the down payment, he is the guarantee. It's as if God, when he adopts you into his family, when he saves you, when he causes you to be born again, he says, mine, and he puts a seal on you, the Holy Spirit. And then another one, mine, that one's mine, that one's mine, my down payment, I have bought this one, I purchased this with the blood, he, he belongs to me, she belongs to me, they're my children, I've got a place prepared for them, I, and I've given the Holy Spirit as my down payment, as my proof. I don't know if y'all ever grew up and your mom had, had to go, they, they used, to, used to have what was called a layaway plan. Y'all remember the layaways? We went to a shop at a place called Heels. If you don't know what Heels is like, it's like a Kmart. Oh, if you don't know what a Kmart's like, it's like a, it's like a Walmart. And, uh, and so we would, we would go there, you know, Christmas time would come, and we'd pick out some toys. And, and so uh, uh, if you couldn't afford to buy all of it at, the, at once, you could, you could lay it away. And, and you would, they'd take it to the back room, they'd give you a little note, and, and you'd put your down payment on that. And Paul says that we've been promised that when this tent fades away and we close this tent up, that we are going to receive one day, there's going to be a, we're going to receive a glorified body, an eternal dwelling, a heavenly home that's, that cannot be destroyed. And we can believe it because the Holy Spirit is the guarantee that it will happen. How many of y'all think that sounds good? Say Amen. Type amen. If you're watching on Facebook, type amen right there. That would be a good time to, to say amen. Let's go on. Let's look at verse 6. He says, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Here's some good news. Death doesn't change my purpose because my faith directs it. Isn't that good news? Death doesn't change my purpose because faith directs it. Now, now th let me just get you something to chew on. Have you ever thought about this? That your purpose on earth can be the same as it is in heaven or in his kingdom. Well, I don't sound right. That sounds a little odd. Let, 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 look what he says. Let's go to verse 9 specifically. Look at verse 9. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to what? Please him. Now, what's this home and away thing? He's talking about whether we're at home, whether we're, we're here in this earthly tent, or in the heavenly dwelling, in the eternal kingdom, where we're with God, either here or there. Now, Paul says, I, you know, I long sometimes to, to be with him because to be, because uh, I, I, we're, we're absent. And we're absent in the sense that we're not physically in the presence of Jesus, right? There, there's a sense in me that... Paul says, sometimes I, I just, I wish I was already in heaven. Now, I don't know if anybody of y'all feel that way. I, I know that it may be, be times in, in life and you look at the world around you and you see all of the chaos that's going on. You think, oh, Lord, I wish, I wish you would come on home and come on and get us, right? I mean, there's moments like that when you think it would be better off to, to, to be there. But he says this, whether, whether I am with Jesus there or I'm here, my purpose remains the same. And the purpose is what? To please him. For we walk by faith 
and not by sight. What does it mean to walk by faith? It means not to allow just what we see influence everything that we think and how we live. As Christians, we live different, do we not? We have other, another sense that we go by. We don't just go by what we see. We don't just go by what we hear. We, we go by what we believe. By faith. By faith, Abraham believed. By faith, Abraham believed God, and then it was reckoned unto him as righteousness. And so how, how do we as Christians walk by faith? We believe in the word of God. We believe what he says. And if he has promised that this earthly tent is going to get a heavenly home, we believe it. If we believe that Jesus died and he rose again, we believe it. If he says that, that if you confess your sin and ask him to forgive you of your sins and you will be saved, we believe that. Whatever he says, we believe. When we, we walk by his orders and his his commands, his ways. And we believe that his ways are right. The world may say otherwise. The world may claim this path is the right path, but the Bible says, no, it is this path. And, and, and as a believer, when you come to a, a fork in the road between what the world is telling you and even what you might see and, and feel with the flesh you, you go with the Spirit, and you walk by faith. Because broad, the Bible says, is the road to destruction. Narrow is the path to eternal life. The world has all kinds of things that are illusions of truth, but aren't truth. And if you go by just what you see and what you hear and you adopt the philosophies and the ideologies of this world, then you will not live a life pleasing to the Lord. To live a life pleasing to the Lord, you must walk by faith. And by walking by faith, it means that you are listening to the voice of God and you're following his ways. And so how do we, how do we please him? Do we just please him on Sundays? Or please him every day. Living a life pleasing to the Lord. That's, boy, that's a, that's a good, that's just a good purpose to ponder on, isn't it? It makes me want to ask this question of myself, and hopefully maybe you ask this question too. Am I pleasing God with my life? Like, am I pleasing him? Like, do I make the Lord proud like throughout the day like am i pleasing him uh am i am i waking up with the mindset that, that that the lord has given me another day to live and i'm grateful and i and i pray to him and i hear from him and i submit to him and i say god this is your day today is a gift from you i'm going to encounter many people today i, I don't know what those encounters are going to be uh, maybe you have a meeting that, that you have might be difficult or you're going to be around a lot of people. Maybe you need to just say, Lord, today, you know, I'm going to be around some folks that might try me and test me, help me to calm down and be patient and not, not overreact. Help me to be a witness where I go to work. Help me to do my job and do it well. Let my life reflect that, it, that I, I believe you. May I speak with truthfulness? May I, uh, may, may I walk in a way that, that others can say, man, that, that man or that woman, there's something different about them. They're, I walk with honesty and integrity, and my life reflects that I have really encountered a living Savior, and I believe that what Jesus says is true, and, and because he has given me some ways to walk in it, I walk in it, and, and I, don't, I don't carry on and and, and, and be little and berate and, and act honorary and speak improperly. Is my life pleasing to the Lord? Because that is a purpose 
that is for here and in the kingdom. When, when, when we're in heaven and then when, he, when, he, when he makes new heaven, new earth, what's, what's going to be our purpose? To please him. So whether we're there or here, I can live out God's purpose. And it's to please him. Uh, I think a good question for every one of us to ask before we go to sleep at night would be, Lord, did, did I please you? Did my life please you today? Was there anyone that I offended? Was there anything that, 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 that I embraced that I shouldn't have? Did I please you, God? Good question, isn't it? Now, he, he, he says uh, one last thing before we uh, wrap things up. Verse 10, he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, We've got some different demographics here in the service today. So I'll talk to the high school kids and the college students here. All right, scenario, here you go. You got to talk with me. Y'all ready? You got to paint the picture. You're in a classroom, okay? And you get there and the teacher walks in and says, all right, put all books away. Get out a, 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 a pen and a piece of paper. Okay, first off, what do you, what do you know is coming? A test. We call it a what? A pop quiz. How many of y'all love the pop quizzes? Raise your hand. I, I, no, right? I'm like, a, now, who looked forward to a pop quiz? Okay, the teacher. <laughs> yeah, the teacher. They really look forward to a pop quiz. Come on, talk to me. Who looked forward to a pop quiz? What? Okay, let me, let me rephrase it. What kind of student looked forward to a pop quiz? Okay, <laughs> I've heard. Uh, is it? Can we say nerd? Is that offensive today? <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> Those who have studied, okay, the well-prepared student. <laughs> let's say that the well-prepared student is like pop quiz. You can just see it all over them. Right? They're like, I mean, you know the kids that ain't been studying at all, right? <laughs> but, but the kids that had been studying, they're like confident, right? Confident. Uh, because, because why? Because they have been preparing and they have been living in such a way that is pleasing to the teacher. See, now, when we think about the judgment seat of Christ, okay, now, Jesus is our Savior, but he is also Lord and Judge, okay, and, and we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That can be very scary or it can be very encouraging, can it? Depending your relationship with God. You know, when you're, um, let's hit the adults. So you're at work and you've been. Um, Skimming a little bit off the top. Lying a little bit here. Cheating a little bit there. Coming in late, leaving early. And you've been secretly trying to make it look like you're productive, but really you're not. And then all of a sudden you get this, this phone call from your boss. It says, hey... <clears throat> I want us to meet on Friday this week because we need to have a discussion about your performance. 
What's your uh, emotion? Scared. Uh oh. Right? But when you've been putting the hours in, being a blessing to the company, making it even better for, for the boss and everyone else around, and you've been, you've, been, you've, been, you've been doing your work and you've been doing it hard, you've been doing it as if you're doing it to the Lord, and the boss says, calls you up, hey, says, I, I want to meet with you Friday. I want to meet, talk to you about your performance. What's your attitude? Raise. Yeah, whoa. Finally, somebody recognized, right? And, 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 and so, so now I, I want us to, to think on this. Death doesn't hinder my reward because Christ gives it. Now, the greatest reward that we receive through salvation is, is, is to be able to be with him forever. Right? Entrance into the kingdom. Now, let's think about it. What does this mean? Everything, whether good or evil. We're all going to stand before the, the Lord and we're going to give an account for our life. And, 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 and this evaluation, based on how it's written in the original and other verses, I, I would I would argue, doesn't mean that God is necessarily going to look at every single little detail that you have done, right? Where you're going to, he's going to be like, okay, let's go. Back in 93, I don't know what you were thinking. And 97, again, problem. Now, 99, it seems like, you know, close to when it got to 2000, you started straightening it up. But then, January 2nd, back down. <laughs> you'll get it. Some of you will get it later. You'll be like, oh, that was good. And, but that he's going to evaluate the totality of your character, whether it be good or evil. Why? And how you live. You see, the Lord knows who are his. He knows his sheep. And he knows them by name. Okay. Here's the reality. Now, this is scary. And sometimes the truth should scare us. This ain't a scare tactic, but sometimes the truth should just scare us. There will be many, the Bible says, who think they are saved but are not. For the Lord will separate on his right, he will take the sheep, and to the left will be the goats. The righteous and the unrighteous. Those who've walked by faith, those who walk by sight. Those who walked in the Spirit and was sealed by the Holy Spirit, those who walked in the flesh. But there will be many who will say, Lord, did we not do this in your name? Did we not do that? And, 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 and he will reply to them, and I think this is important. Listen to his reply. He, 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 said, he will say to them, and then the Son of Man will say to them, Depart from me, for I never knew you. Never. Not once knew you, and now no longer, but I never knew you. We all realized how quickly life can be taken Saturday. Like that. Here's a question I would ask. Do you know for certain that if you were to die today, that heaven would be your home? Do you have the assurance to know that your reward would be heaven because you know Christ is going to give that to you because you know him and he knows you? You see, it's a little different 
when you get caught and you stand before a judge and you say, oh, I know the judge. You might know the judge, but the judge might not know you. It's a whole different scenario. When you say, oh, I know the judge, and the judge says, I know you. There's going to be many church members who will spend eternity in hell. So, so this morning, here, here's, a, here's a question. I'm, I'm not asking you, are you a member of this church? I'm not asking you if you are a member of any church. I'm asking you, have you called upon the name of the Lord Jesus and are you believing in his death, burial, and resurrection for your salvation? And have you called upon his name and he's changed your life to the point to where you please him? And your goal in life is to please him. You see, the character nature of a child of God should be the one that is ready at any time to meet the maker. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be perfect because we've all, those of us who are Christians, we, we sometimes have said something we shouldn't have done and we've acted in ways that we shouldn't have acted and sometimes we fall in the mud. How many of y'all have ever fallen in the mud, huh? But the difference between a genuine believer and a pretender is that we don't wallow in the mud and stay in the mud and then say the mud's not mud. Anyone who calls themselves a believer and can live in continual habitual sin in violation of God's word and never feel condemnation, repentance, or uh, conviction over that and, and try to redefine everything, they're not a believer. But a child of God, when we sin against, against him and we walk in ways that's not pleasing to him, the Holy Spirit of God, that guarantee, he, he stirs in us and he lets us know that we did, that's not how we should act. That's not what we should say. That's not how we should behave. You should be pleasing God. Hey, and by the way, can, can, I, can I just remind everyone and that, remind myself too, I'll you remind myself too, that, that it's not the, the person working the cashier's fault that there's not enough workers. So how, how, you, how you treat them matter. That, that waiter and that waitress who's waiting and serving you that, that because they don't have enough workers and, and he or she may have too many tables that they shouldn't have and it's a little slow, um, how you respond to them matters. If you were to die today, would heaven be your home? That's a good question. That reality causes Paul to say this in verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we want persuade others. I... I I've asked this before, and I know that um, we all can picture people in our mind. Who in your life do you know that, that, that seems to not have a love for the Lord and an interest in eternal things? Who are they? Write their name down. Pray for them. Begin Asking the Holy Spirit to open up opportunities for you to help persuade them. Because a person who doesn't know the Lord, who is not saved, who when this earthly tent folds up, there's not joy waiting for them. Because when Jesus is sitting on his throne and he's separating the sheep from the goat, the wheat from the tares, the righteous from the unrighteous. The unrighteous are cast where there is weeping 
and gnashing of teeth. And for those who are on the right, are said by the Lord, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you rulers over many. Come enter the joy of my rest. Let me ask you this again. If you were to die today, do you know for certain that heaven would be my home? You say, well, pastor, I think I, I think I would be. That's not good enough. That's not a good enough answer. I wouldn't, I wouldn't live by that. You say, well, 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 pastor, I hope I'll go to heaven. I hope I'll be there again. Man, that's, that's not good enough. Well, maybe. Nope. Our faith is not just a hope so, think so, maybe so faith. It's a no so faith. And so when John writes his letter, my dear children, I write these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. So this morning... Have you trusted in what Jesus has done? That's why he came, to seek and save the lost. He came to die for the sinner, for the unrighteous, so that we may be made righteous. And so today, if you hear his voice and he calls you out and says, hey, be saved, you need to trust, you need to to believe, today's the day of salvation. Amen? And for those of us who know him, we got to rest in the promises that he has given us and make it our aim to what? Please him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus.